Ah, sh**. Here we go again. Three weeks ago, a new game theory video was released, and the theory was... questionable, to say the least. I made a reaction to the theory where I basically debunked most of the points that MatPat brought up, and people went on to basically prove my point that I made at the top of, of the video when I said MatPat stands will believe anything he says just because of his status in the FNAF community. Correct. And that is exactly what I expected to happen, and it's what actually happened. Another game theory has also come out since then, talking about how there could be robot Elizabeth Aftons, and that theory I don't believe, but it's not nearly as bad as this one. Now, I have nothing against MatPat. I think he's a good person, at least as far as I know, and some of his theories are pretty good. I consider myself a fan of MatPat, but as a theorist, there's always some theories that it seems like you don't research enough, causing the theory to be basically completely wrong. MatPat's theory from three weeks ago was about the idea of the first four FNAF games only being games in-universe, throwing everything from those games into question. He claimed that the existence of Golden Freddy and the bite victim are questionable, that the missing kids didn't possess animatronics, and among other things. So I decided to make a video refuting his evidence and his theory as a whole, as there is so much that he missed that that prevents this theory from even being possible. But since a large portion of my friends, and by that I mean all of them, disagree with MatPat's theory as well, I decided to bring along a couple of them in a three-way collab with me, Shadow Libra, and Arcade Endo about why MatPat was wrong about the Tales from the Beats of Black story, Help Wanted. Hey everyone! Hello there! This is Shadow Libra, and welcome to the video. First, I'd like to say thank you to Evan for having me on this video, and I'd also like to say that you should all totally subscribe to me. My channel will be in the description of this video. Anyways, let's begin. MatPat's first point is how Steve doesn't actually know how many murders were at Freddy's. But, like, do you really think a normal person would know off the top of their head how many murders happened at a crappy pizzeria chain more than 50 years ago? Probably not. MatPat also has this odd point that FNAF 4 is just Steve going crazy with his hallucinations, except he seemed to have forgotten that FNAF 4 was never finished. We don't really know what Steve made of FNAF 4. The only hint we have is they could be the Night Terrors levels in VR, but since FNAF 4 wasn't finished, that means either FNAF 4 was never made into a game, or it is just an unfinished game that's very different from the actual FNAF 4. The development of the game Steve makes is kind of weird, because the, the first two games take him some time, but not too long. But the way the story is written implicitly tells us that Steve literally made the third game in only one day. Maybe it's just a weird thing from writing, but that's what seems to happen. But the night that he finishes the third game is actually the night he dies. He sits on the couch after a long day's worth of work, somehow starting and finishing game three in just that day, and when Victoria goes off to bed, that's when the spiders show up, and he learns the truth and dies. He doesn't get to finish the fourth game before he dies. And based on how the story goes, it doesn't seem like he even starts to work on the fourth game yet before dying. Steve not finishing the fourth game also perfectly matches how there is no FNAF 4 section of Help Wanted. While there are FNAF 4-esque minigames, we have FNAF 1, 2, FNAF 3, but not FNAF 4. This definitively proves that the in-universe FNAF games do not include FNAF 4. It is not a game in universe. But FNAF 4 not being a game single handedly disproves almost MatPat's entire theory. It disproves the idea of the bite victim not existing. It disproves Golden Freddy not existing, too, which we will get to a bit later. You know what I absolutely hate about this video, though? The fact that MatPat completely slanders the phrase four games, one story. He says it means FNAF 1 to 4 are just games and not real canon events. He then goes on to say the missing children may have never been a missing or that they never actually possessed the animatronics, when we literally see the kids' graves at the end of Pizzeria Simulator. Exactly. See, the graves of the missing kids were shown in the Lorekeeper ending. However, we actually see six graves, the five missing kids, and Charlie in the back, separate from the rest. FNAF 6 is not a game in universe, and it is entirely canon, which we know from Security Breach. What? So these graves are absolutely depicting the canon number of children. The amount of dead kids also matches the murders from the first two FNAF games. This shows that Steve did know about the number of children, because he's making games about these murders. Fazbear Entertainment informed him that he would mostly have creative freedom, but that it would still have to be mostly accurate to the rumors in order to fully discredit them. Because of this, Steve most likely would have done research into it. 
that's how he would know about the number of dead kids, and if he researched that, who's to say that he didn't research more? Steve also heard rumors of paranormal stuff surrounding Freddy's, which goes against the claim that the animatronics weren't possessed. What's up nerds, Arcade here, and thank you Evan for having me on. So without further introduction, let's begin. The ending of FNAF 6 shows us the Give Gifts, Give Life minigame and screenshots of FNAF 1 and 2. This shows that these are absolutely real events and not just games. Henry talks about the animatronics being possessed and how the kids got turned into remnant and injected into the fun times in the insanity ending of Pizzeria Simulator, meaning the possession happened. The Silver Eyes trilogy is all about how the original five animatronics are possessed by the missing children after William lured them into a back room and killed them, proving that the animatronics are possessed. Yes, the books are in an alternate continuity, however they still have elements that we can apply to the games. Four games, one story literally just means FNAF 1 to 4 all follow someone's story. When Scott actually gave us the four games, one story clue, there were only four games in the series. All he was saying was that the first four games followed the same story. To me, it seems like the first four games are specifically following the story of the bite victim, and that the story of his death and happiest day were the main plotline those first three games conveyed. It shows how his death sparks Michael's journey into being the character, in my opinion. I think it is meant to be the story of the crying child. This idea mainly comes from me believing BB Fifth. It also works slightly differently under things like Golden Duo or Golden Trio. If Scott were to have said four games, one story today, I think it would say 13 games, one story, nine games, 11 games, whatever. If Scott said it today, it wouldn't have been four games, one story. It could have been whatever number of games are canon nowadays, since FNAF 1 to Security Breach do seem to all involve the crying child in some way, and it all follows the same general storyline. And if you are to argue that the newer games are a different story, as Mephat's theory suggests, then it would be eight games, one story. We see how the bite victim connects to the biggest two plot points of the series, the Aftons and the missing children. He is part of the Afton family, and in most of the games we are playing as his older brother, Michael amending for past mistakes, for killing the bite victim. On the other hand, I do believe the plushies in FNAF Foreign World create a connection between the crying child and the missing children, and even if you don't believe that Happiest Day does show the crying child, he is most likely Golden Freddy either way through theories like Golden Duo and Golden Trio, like I said, which would still connect him to the other missing children. The survival logbook depicts the faded text asking the bite victim if he misses them. It is referring to the missing kids, implying that the bite victim was friends with them, which seems to be the case whether the missing children's incident was before the bite or not. I believe it is, but even if it is after, Crying Child still seems to be friends with those missing kids. Speaking of the bite victim, MatPat says his existence can be put into question, with his main argument being, well, he's not referenced in any games after FNAF 4, except he is. In Sister Location, we find in the private room that the FNAF 4 house is real. We also see the Fred plush in that same room. In the break room, we see a map of the FNAF 4 house above Circus Babies, plus a map of Fred Bears and the minigame house. We see a white dot in the crying child's room. Where else is this white dot? in the gameplay room and Plush Traps Hall. This, plus 1983 being part of the keypad, all show us the crying child was being experimented on in 1983. In Pizzeria Simulator, we visit what looks like to be the FNAF 4 house on the menu screen. There is also a lazy couch potato watching TV, like Mike is in the sister location, wearing a grey t-shirt and speaking in grey text. This guy tells Orange Guy to leave him alone, and the orange guy says that he has run away again. Then we find our son has run off. The grey text is the text colour Michael spoke back in FNAF 4. It's the colour shirt he wears in FNAF 4, and he watches TV like in Sister Location when he watched Immortal and the Restless. The kid who ran away is clearly his younger brother. The crying child is even our player character in Security Breach, or well, not exactly. But in a way, Evan and I believe Greg Bot. Besides Gregory looking like the crying child, he also is guided by a bear who calls him broken, kind of like the crying child's Fredbear plush. He also takes a big bite out of a yellow Freddy's head, which seems to be a reverse bite of 83. And Gregory is deemed a worthy character for visiting a hill that looks suspiciously like the gravestone hill from the Lorekeeper ending of FNAF 6. There is a lot more I could say about both Gregbot and the Crying Child throughout the series, but Evan has already made an entire video based around the idea of Gregory specifically being a robot. 
The important part here, though, is that Gregory is very likely a representation of the bite victim at the very least, and this shows that the bite victim does exist. MadPat's claim about the bite victim not existing is absolutely not correct, but he also made another point that maybe Golden Freddy was never real. When trying to justify that claim, he made passing reference to how Golden Freddy appears in FNAF World, but that's obviously not canon. He's only ever shown up in titles with questionable canonicity, like FNAF World, which is definitely not canon. Except the problem with that claim is that Scott himself has confirmed that FNAF World is canon. In the Daco interview, Scott claims that he regrets tying FNAF World into a a canon game, that game being FNAF 3, and also FNAF 4. I, I had to make something more lighthearted, and in, and in hindsight, what I should have done is, you know, I, sh I should have used that for a troll game, or I should have, yeah. you know, made something like, you know, uh, Foxy Fighters, you know, I, I should have just, I should have just done something that was obviously for fun and mm -hmm. not tried to somehow tie it in to a canon game, you know, and, and that's obvious to me now, but like I'm saying, you know, like I was saying, I'm not, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking completely rationally at the yeah. time. FNAF World was also not made as a game in-universe, meaning that it is not just made up stuff, and the game's plot is us setting up Happy's day from FNAF 3 for the bite victim from FNAF 4. This means that the bite victim does exist, and since Happy's day is for the spirit, or one of the spirits that exists in Golden Freddy, then Golden Freddy himself has to exist. MatPat claiming Golden Freddy isn't real doesn't make sense. Not just for what Evan just explained, not just because of the novel trilogy, not just the new kid, but there's even characters like Yendo, whose name is literally Yellow Endo, an obvious reference to Golden Freddy's original name of Yellow Bear. Not only that, but Yendo even behaves just like Golden Freddy. This leads me to believe Yendo is Golden Freddy. In Pizzeria Simulator, it is already confirmed by Henry the missing children are in Molten Freddy. So that's where Golden Freddy would be in that game. The way Molten MCI works also revolves around the original animatronics endoskeletons being melted together, which requires them to be possessed. So even if Yendo himself wasn't Golden Freddy, Golden Freddy's spirit is still present in all the other fun times alongside the other missing kids. Ultimate Custom Night is literally shown to us to be Golden Freddy torturing William in a hell-like state. Not only is this shown in the final cutscene of the game itself, but the man in room 1280 also confirms this by having the spirit of Andrew be behind Ultimate Custom Night. Remember, Andrew was the body in Golden Freddy in The New Kid. Golden Freddy also appears in Security Breach, as the Princess Quest files call the golden colored princess who wants to put a stop to William and is guided by Old Man Consequences. They call her Cassidy. Evan also believes that Glamrock Freddy is possessed by the spirit of the bite victim because there's so many Golden Freddy references surrounding Glamrock Freddy. While I disagree with that, if it were to be true, then that would disprove both Golden Freddy and the bite victim not existing. Golden Freddy also appears in FNAF AR. MatPat mentioned in his video that FNAF AR is not canon, so this does not matter, but this simply is not true. His reasoning for this was also quite lacking, as it was merely, I refuse to live in a world where Shamrock Freddy and Chocolate Bunny are real. While seemingly this super important piece of the lore to the franchise hasn't shown up in a major way in any recent titles, he's only ever shown up in titles with questionable canonicity, like FNAF World, which is definitely not canon, Custom Night, which is Afton's personal hell, and FNAF AR, which isn't really canon. And if you think it is, then both Shamrock Freddy and Chocolate Bonnie are canon, and I refuse to live in a world where that could possibly be true. In FNAF AR, there are lots of emails talking about the delivery service and how the animatronics in it have a virus. This confirms that FNAF AR is absolutely canon. He even argues that if FNAF AR is canon, then Shamrock Freddy and Chocolate Bonnie are canon, and that he doesn't want to live in a world that they are true, that, that is true, as I mentioned previously. However, Chocolate Bonnie and numerous other FNAF AR skins appear on the arcades of Security Breach, confirming that the skins are canon, and so is the rest of FNAF AR. Therefore, Golden Freddy being in FNAF AR disproves the idea of Golden Freddy being fake. Anyways, that's all for me in this video, so I'm going to pass the mic back to the base Shadow Libra, where he will make his closing argument. Goodbye humans, and have a wonderful day. MatPat really misinterpreted Help Wanted, as the beginning of the story made it clear the idea of making indie games left a bad taste in Steve's mouth. He felt it was wrong to make light of real events. He only does when he is desperate for the money. In FNAF VR, Tape Girl even says the indie dev was hired to make light of what really happened, meaning we are told multiple times while FNAF 1-3 are games, 
They are also real events. FNAF 1 and 2 are referenced in Pizzeria Simulator, the ending of Sister Location shows the aftermath of the FNAF 3 fire, and FNAF 4 is also shown in Sister Location. If the first four games are supposedly not canon, how the hell do you explain any of this? Sorry MatPat, but this theory is just bad. Massive L. Anyways, the mic is getting passed on back to Evan, who will explain away the supposed inconsistency with Golden Freddy's design. Enjoy the rest of the video! I feel like we need to reiterate that we have nothing against MatPat. We'd even consider ourselves fans of his, but as a theorist, sometimes you make theories that simply cannot be true. And while they are just theories, some theories are created without the creator realizing that there are holes within it. That's just kind of what happened here. MatPat's theory simply cannot be true for the reasons we've gone over in this video. But that doesn't really even mean MatPat is a bad theorist. He made a bad theory, yes, but at some point, everyone has. I know I have. <laughs> But just because he made a bad theory doesn't make him stupid and doesn't make him a bad theorist as a whole. So we've gone over all the reasons Matt's theory cannot work, but there's one argument that we haven't addressed. We've talked about the Golden Freddy animatronic absolutely being real, but one of Matt's arguments is understandable. He talks about how Golden Freddy's design is always different from game to game, possibly meaning that it's just a developer who doesn't really know about Golden Freddy, and he's just making it different every game because maybe he doesn't know the true design of him. However, I have reason to believe that they are all different Golden Freddies or Fredbears. Well, except the one from Take Cake minigame from FNAF 2. That was just a while ago and was probably just changed. But there are differences between the Fredbears from FNAF 4 Stage 01 and the Fredbears Family Diner posters from Security Breach, as well as Golden Freddy himself. I believe that all these Fredbear animatronics are actually different ones. Fredbear from FNAF 4 is just an 8-bit sprite, so it's most likely that it's just the same version of Fredbear that we see in Ultimate Custom Night, with a similar design to Golden Freddy from FNAF 1, but with a purple hat and bow tie and with a slightly different body and head shape. But him having a purple hat and bow tie doesn't match Golden Freddy, who has a black hat. Golden Freddy from Stage 01 has a brown hat. Interestingly, Golden Freddy in the Silver Eyes also has a brown hat. Fredbear in the posters from Security Breach kind of looks like just regular Freddy, but you may notice that he's actually a lot lighter, a similar color to the Spring Bonnie in the posters. He's a lot more yellow than regular Freddy. If you look at the Spring Bonnie in these images though, he has a much more similar design to Glitchtrap, not the original Spring Bonnie. Is it possible that these Fredbear posters are actually not depicting the original Fredbear's Family Diner, but one that opened after the original Freddy Fredbear's closed down due to the bite? There was a springlock failure that caused springlocks to get shut down, but there were going to be replacements. However, until those replacements arrived, there were temporary costumes that employees had to wear. Is it possible that those costumes were skin-tight costumes of Spring Bonnie and Fredbear, the same suit as Glitchtrap and one similar to match Fredbear? It is possible. Maybe Fredbear had too much bad PR, so while they kept the name and kept him yellow, they made him a slightly darker yellow and gave him a black hat to distinguish him from the other one. Seemingly before the replacements arrived, the Spring Bonnie suit, like the Springlock suit specifically, is used in the Missing Children incident, and the public knows this as it was in the FNAF 1 newspapers. Therefore, it stands to reason that at this point, both Fredbear and Spring Bonnie had bad PR associated with them, getting the second Fredbear's family diner shut down as both its characters were bad due to the public. This would shut down Springlocks completely. In FNAF 2, Phone Guy says they're going to call the original restaurant owner, and the place was Fredbear's Family Diner. This could be taken as him calling the original owners of the Fredbear's Family Diner from back in the day, but it could also mean that FNAF 2's building was reused from the second Fredbear's Family Diner, also not being the first one as the layout doesn't match. That could just be me reading too much into it, but it's just an idea. But what about Stage 01? Why does that Golden Freddy have a brown hat? Well, what if I told you that this wasn't actually Fredbear's Family Diner, but was actually Freddy Fazbear's Pizza? See, while Fredbear's has Fredbear and Spring Bonnie, Freddy's actually does too, as Phone Guy tells us in the calls from FNAF 3. So, it would be weird if the restaurant shown in the minigames of FNAF 3 that matches what we're told in the calls from FNAF 3 just wasn't the same restaurant. There's also the fact that each minigame from FNAF 3 adds a different child to, ha to the Happiest Day minigame. Stage 01 adds Fritz, who died at Freddy's, not Fredbear's, just like the rest of the missing kids. That means that Stage 01 kid is Fritz and that Stage 01 can't be Fredbear's. 
Since Fredbear's and Freddy's existed simultaneously, these two Fredbear animatronics coexist, meaning they aren't the same animatronic. Stage 01 Golden Freddy has a brown hat though, which doesn't match Golden Freddy from the main games. However, Golden Freddy is a ghostly presence. He teleports around and fades in and out of existence, appearing just as a head sometimes. The Golden Freddy that attacks us isn't physical. However, since the missing kids were stuffed into the animatronics by William, Golden Freddy has to be a physical suit as well. That basically means that the Golden Freddy who attacks us is just a projection the kid or kids inside are making from the suit. William uses the Spring Bonnie suit to kill kids, so he obviously wouldn't stuff kids into that, so he would stuff the kids into all the other ones in the building, including Golden Freddy, who is trapped in the back room. Going back to the Silver Eyes, Golden Freddy has a brown hat, but Golden Freddy in the Silver Eyes isn't a ghostly presence. He is the physical suit. He's not creating a projection here. We know that because he legit gets up and walks around. This shows us that while Golden Freddy who attacks us has a black hat, probably just to convey a darker color or something, or to match the original Freddy's design, the original Golden Freddy suit has a brown hat, not a black one. But that's everything we wanted to talk about for this video. There's actually even more that goes against this theory, but Mr. Pinball actually made his own video, which is much shorter, going over a few of those other things. So check out his video if you haven't already. But for now, I hope you all enjoyed, and I want all of you to go subscribe to Shadow Libra and Arcade Endo, who both make awesome videos and are just awesome people. While they don't upload as often as I do, whenever they do, it is always a banger, so I definitely recommend checking them out. I want to say thank you to them for joining me for this video, and thanks to you guys for watching. Let me know if you want us to do more collabs like this, because it does take some pressure off just one person writing an entire script, and it also gives some recognition to my friends who sometimes do inspire ideas in me, or discuss theories with me and whatnot. So thanks to them for joining, let me know in the comments if you want more collabs, and if you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new, and obviously if you want to. You don't have to if you don't want to, of course, but I'd really appreciate it. I'm hoping to reach 10,000 subscribers before the end of the year. I don't know if we can or will, I don't really think that we will, honestly, but that's my goal, so if you guys could help me reach it, it would mean a lot. I have a great idea for a 10k special that I'm sure you guys would love to see. But anyways guys, I hope we all enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye guys!